Let me ask you this question. How do you start a conversation with someone that knows a little bit about the Lord, someone that knows, you know, they think that they're spiritual, they feel spiritual, they communicate to you, oh, we're, we're a spiritual people. How do you take them deeper, right? Or how do you approach, how do you share with someone? Most of you would say to me, oh, Pastor Ben, I could never stand behind a pulpit, right? Or do you want the chance? You want to come up? No, no. Most of us, not all of us, and, and, and we want to say it's because we're shy, right? Because we're shy. But that's a lie, right? And let me tell you why that's a lie. You're shy until you get to talk to someone. I was at Home Depot, and uh, I was looking for light bulbs. I turn around, and this lady comes up to me. Hablas Espanol? I said, what? Do I look Mexican to you? <laughs> of course. Of course, right? And I said, si, sí, si sí hablo. And so she says, I'm looking for a texture, a kind of paint that could go on the, on the bottom of my bathtub. My kids are slipping, I'm slipping and whatnot. So can you help me ask the attendant? So we talked to the paint guy, got them together, and, and she went off with him. A few minutes later, I'm seeing as I'm exiting the store, and now she's saying, gracias, saying hi and whatnot, right? I'm telling you this because we're only strangers, or we say, I can't talk to people until we are introduced or we help someone with something. Paul, oh, we're going to learn from him today. Your Bible should be open. We're considering the book of Acts. We've reached chapter 17, uh, and we're going to pick it up in verses 1 through 4. But before we read, so we get our spirits right, let's go before the Lord. Father God, it's been a privilege to sing to you this morning. It's been a privilege to raise our voices to the King of Kings, the soon coming King. And now we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would quicken your words that we read and we consider this morning, and that you, Holy Spirit, would speak to our hearts, for we want to win others for you. Help us do our, do our job in bringing one more to the kingdom. Help us to do it through our life, through our example, through our speaking words, and help us, Lord, capture, if we may, Perhaps what we could call a style or the way that Paul did. Now, Lord, you do things not to rubber stamp something, a style or things like that. But may it help us form our own. Lord, you always work best when we just be ourselves. When we could just be ourselves and you work through our personality and the things that our, our exposure has been through, Lord. And that's what we want to do, Lord. But help us capture an example this morning, perhaps, from the Apostle Paul and the guys and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. And I know there's many flavors out there. This just happens to be mine. I love it. Right? God's word says this. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And then Paul, as his custom was, went into them. And for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. You may be seated. Short and brief, right? Right? I bet you wish I could be short and brief. <laughs> but that's not my way. My way is to talk about Jesus. My way is to share what the Lord has put in my heart as I study through the scriptures, as I open it up and I look at the words and I say, Oh, Lord, speak to our church on Sunday. Lord, do a new work in us. We all have been walking with you for a while. Some of us are, consider ourselves even old timers. I've been behind the pulpit now over 35 years preaching and teaching and doing these kind of things. I've been in foreign countries doing it. And it's always exciting to get into the Word of God and God reveals something new. But perhaps you're a Christian that's a little stale. You, you, you know it. You love the Lord. But you haven't really walked with the Lord. You, it's up here, but sometimes it just has a hard time coming down those 13, 14 inches to our hearts. And uh, I pray that the Lord will awaken you in these last days. And why do we call them last days? How many of you guys saw the opening of the Olympics? Right? What a mockery on Christianity. 
What a huge mockery to take the Last Supper, a portrait of the Last Supper, and turn it around and make it an all um, uh, gay thing or whatever you call those things, right? I mean, it was horrible. What a slap across Christianity around the world. Well, guess what? The Lord told you in the last days, bad would be good, good would be bad. We try to do the good things. They call us haters because we tell people there's only one way to heaven. And we said, we didn't say it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? So you're going to call us narrow-minded. Hey, we're just standing on the Word of God because the Word of God is life. The Word of God uh, is faithful. And because of the Word of God, many of us are here this day. Amen? So we know there's a heaven. We know it's just in front of us. It can happen today that the Lord is going to whisk us away. It can happen before the end of uh, the Olympics, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, a country that is okay with making a mockery in front of billions of people across the world, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. If you know any of the French, pray for them in a French way. You know, uh, don't even eat French fries anymore. I don't know. But uh, that, no, just kidding. I love French fries. Um, you can tell. Uh, but uh, uh, we need to be aware of the times that we're in. We really need to be aware. So it comes to this. Then how, what can I do in these last minutes? What can I do in these last days? Well, prayerfully, you'll think today, you'll think this morning, and from the scripture, you'll take with you at least the beginning, a method, uh, uh, something that I can do so that I can present. And I'll tell you, once you begin to present Jesus, he takes over. How many of you guys know that's true? The Holy Spirit, part of his job is to bring to remembrance those things that you have taken in, and you are taking in uh, via this morning, the scripture. So, as we conclude chapter 16, just want to bring you up to date. God indeed physically made opportunity for Paul, Silas, and the rest of the prisoners, all those inmates that were locked up, right, to be free. They had a choice to go. <laughs> we learned that the Philippian jailer was about to kill himself because he knew the way of the world, the way people are. But Paul called out to him and assured him that every inmate, every prisoner that was there was present and accounted for. Well, the jailer, uh, he was moved by the event. He had heard Paul and Silas at the midnight hour. They were worshiping the Lord. He knew why they were under his uh, uh, restraint, if you may. Because they've been talking about Jesus. They've been talking about one God. And, and in Philippi, where they were, Macedonia, Rome had taken over, but they allowed them to run their place. But Rome, remember, Rome had, the way they believe is their Caesar was appointed by the gods. So Caesar was a god for their time. And when Paul starts talking about Jesus and the soon coming king, it just wild up the people. And uh, they were against him for that uh, from a political sense. Because if you live in the world, if they got your social security, they tell you if you can buy or sell, they tell you this and that, you're going to comply. And if you go against the grain, not a good thing for you. You know that in the world. In the spiritual world, the things that we know about the world, we know that Satan has a plan and it is to snuff us out the quickest and uh, worst way possible. But anyway, he was in jail and yet this earthquake happened. And when this earthquake happened, it just shook everybody's chains loose. And so they all could have gone. So the jailer knew why Paul was there. He had heard uh, the reasons why. And so he humbles himself because they're still all there. Could you imagine going through death row, uh, uh, general population, lock up a max or whatever, and all the guys, inmates are still there? Nobody's left. They've all been attentive to the words of Paul and Silas. So the jailer, knowing this and knowing his life is going to be spared because everyone's there, comes and humbles himself before Paul and Silas. And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And we learned that the entire uh, family, the jailer's family, the whole household came to Christ. They were baptized. It was amazing. And lastly, when the authorities had sent word to release and send Paul and Silas their way, Paul pulled his, I'm a minority card, or I am a handicapped person. What did Paul say? I am a Roman card. 
He pulled out his Roman badge, right? He pulled it out. He wouldn't budge until the authority, the big shots themselves. And when they heard this, the Bible says they became, oh my gosh, we have imprisoned one of our own. We beat one of our own. We t put this guy in stocks and didn't even have a trial for him. And he's a Roman and they're under Roman, you know, influence. They were scared. But Paul, what is this with Paul? Do you guys know people that have a very strong personality? They call them A-types. <laughs> you do. Most husbands are. Then they come to Jesus and they become a little bit more, you know, wonderful husbands, right? But uh, Paul had this A-personality type. He, most of us, when the first guard says, hey, man, you've been free, you could go. Most of us said, adios, I'm a ghost. And we would have gone, right? But not Paul. Paul says, well, no, we were Romans and we were treated unfairly. And now we want your bosses to come and let us out himself. Who does that? It, it kind of shows you how this man is made. And it's not a bad thing. It's that Paul was for justice. Paul wanted things done right. And some of us guys just want things done right. Don't mow the lawn this way and that way and make circles around the yard. You're not a hippie on grass anymore. Don't do that. Right? You mow the lawn going this way, and then you back up the same way, tires. Put it up, and then you mow it this way, and you come. No, just kidding. But Paul was that kind of guy. He just wanted things done right. And so what happens? The authorities did come. They did come, right? And they personally let them go. They asked them to leave the city, and they did. And with that, we are now ready for the rest of the scripture. Look at your Bible. I want to begin with location, location, location. So here we go. Uh, we started off in Jerusalem. We went up to Antioch. This was the first missionary journey, but we are in the second missionary journey. It is from here that they go up, right? And God said no to Asia and no to this and that. And it, what's interesting is when God has you on a plan and he wants to get to Europe, this is Europe, this is the Aegean Sea. When God wants you to get to Europe and when God wants you to do things right, he doesn't let you go to the right. He doesn't let you go to the left. The Holy Spirit uh, keeps us on the straight and narrow and they come down to trust. And sometimes to you and I, it is not clear why the Lord has said no when we start venturing out. But aren't you glad that he has said no to a lot of things in our lives? He has said no to us, and that no has wound up being one of the best things in our lives. And we don't believe it at first. At first, oh, Lord, come on. I prayed even with one knee and then two knees, and you know, I did a little hallelujah dance before you, and you still said no? Yes, because God, the Holy Spirit, wants to help you get right and get straight and stay on track, stay on mission with the things of the Lord. When they got to Troas, down at the bottom, um, that's where the Macedonian call came, where that's when the Lord spoke to Paul and says, come over and help us. So we read, he comes over, uh, they meet, meet Lydia, she becomes the first uh, a lady uh, in Europe to be saved, and it began to be a wonderful time. Now, uh, so we get to verse 1, it says, now when they had passed through, again, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Church, the missionary journey continues, and while they don't know, while they don't know what lies ahead, Christians know that God does. Amen? You don't know what tomorrow has, but God does, right? So knowing this, right, knowing that God does, and that they are in His will, and how do we know we're in the will of God? Uh, because God wants want, asked the disciples to take this message everywhere, right? First in Jerusalem, then and Samaria, then to the other most parts of the world. And so he knows, Paul knows, I'm on mission. I know what the will of God is, and this is what we're doing. So it keeps you, it kept, it kept them motivated, right? Now, the same is true for you and me today. We venture in doing things that honor God and leave the rest to Him. Let me give you two examples. Yesterday, uh, we had a women's uh, luncheon. And we had a testimony time. And it was an amazing time. And we had like 81, 82 women here at church and the tables. And I'm glad for this facility that we could turn it around and whatnot. Thank you for the volunteers. And um, great food, 
great uh, word of God, great uh, uh, revelation of what God has done in people's lives. And the Lord blessed it. It was great. Judy calls me, okay, it's over. Why don't you come in and have a little salad with me? And so I come in after it's supposedly over. And what you love about God's people is they don't know when to go home. <laughs> I walked in. I thought, is she getting ready to speak? I thought it was over with. No, people were just chatting, having a good time and whatnot. So Judy makes me this a humongous salad with just about everything in the planet that's green and good for the ladies. It was good, you know. But Judy reminded me there was chicken and there was ham and there was the meat group was there. So praise God. Troy, looking forward to breakfast on uh, Saturday next week. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, good stuff. So that was a good thing. That was knowing the Lord's will for his kids to gather Women to be encouraged, you know, husbands to be, what greater place than your wife being at church than shopping? I mean, I'm sorry, than doing other things, but it was a good thing. Later on, through George uh, Hernandez and, and the P. Uh, Praise Him Ministries, we had uh, Brett Walker at the park, and we had Carl Mecklenburg give a testimony. How I many you guys remember Carl Mecklenburg, right? I mean, this guy was a champion football player, and uh, he brought a message that was phenomenal. And after the message, uh, he made himself available for autographs. So I was able to uh, take my grandson Isaiah. Hey, let's get in line. Let's get an autograph. We didn't have nothing to write on or whatever. And I found a little note uh, in my wallet. So I opened it up and whatnot. On the sticky side, he still wrote and signed his autograph. Then I, I had to ask him, hey, um, how can I get a hold of you? So maybe we can invite you to come down to Calvary Chapel Montrose and share with us. Should I go through George? Is that the channels? He looks at him directly. He gave me his business card. And he said, call me. Well, this morning, before I came to see you, well, I sent my little letter to him, inviting him. What would it take to come to Calvary Chapel Montrose and talk to us? Right, fall's coming. What happens in fall? Go long. Go oh, Football season, right? Ladies, I don't want to leave you out, but I also put in a little small print. If your wife comes with you, which she will be invited, maybe she could do a luncheon for the women like we had yesterday. Pray. Pray that the Lord will continue to bless us, give us ideas, help us financially to make these things happen. Why? Because Jesus is coming soon, and we need to be equipped from all sides, our children, our, our relatives, and everyone to get excited about Jesus. Paul and the guys are on mission because they love Jesus, and they want to talk about Jesus. And that's what should spur us forward and be open to talk to people, to talk to others about Jesus. You don't have to be a graduate from Dallas or, or this or that. It's great if you can. You don't have to go to JC or, or whatever to talk about Jesus. Are you kidding me? You just need to know him, fall in love with him. Remember, like the song said, you were always there, Lord. You were always there. It reminded me a um, few weeks into basic training. We had, a, I think I told you this before, we had a, a, a night, um, I almost said night vision. It was a, a night fire. Right, and they were going to shoot tracers, and were teaching us to stay down. And you could see the tracers over your head. And I'm a kid that was born in East Los Angeles. LA was my whole world. I never been east of the San Bernardino Mountains, if you may, uh, which are right next door. And uh, uh, I was in Kentucky. I was so far away from home, right? And we did our exercise, and ours was the second or third uh, uh, platoon that went by. And uh, I remember sitting off to the side and whatnot by myself, and I'm thinking, man, I'm a long ways from home. Man, I'm, a, you know, I'm going to Vietnam. It's, it's just going to happen, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking about these things. And all of a sudden, like this hand of the Lord touched me and said, I am with you. I am with you no matter where you go, no matter where I am. And so when we sing these songs, these songs, the people that write these songs, these lyrics, if you're praising the Lord, if you're worshiping him, these things are going to cut through your heart in a good way like a hot knife going through butter. It is amazing. It reminds you at that time when I called out to the Lord, he was there. So when we talk about going out and talking to people, Paul and the team is doing just that, right? So they, they're going, right? Uh, 
Back to these guys, the missionary team being led by Paul. They were aware that there is a spiritual battle for the souls of mankind. You know, I know, they were aware. And you always need to be aware. When you're talking to someone, behind the scenes is the devil trying to hold that person back or mess you up. Right? The devil does not want to let go of a person. While the Lord, the creator of mankind, the one that created us in his own image and has given us free will, right? Uh, he gives every opportunity through the gospel uh, to be preached, to be presented as our missionaries here on team so that that person would come to the Lord, so that person uh, can give their hearts to Jesus. So these missionaries are well aware that there is a cost. If you're going to stand out for Jesus, then the enemy is going to come after you. There's always a cost. In fact, personal hazards, as they have already experienced, an ultimate death to them for their witness of the Lord Jesus Christ is a possibility. Remember, they have just been in prison. And now they're moving forward. So you already know up here in your head that bad things come when the devil is after you. And though God's going to protect you, you might have to just give your life and lay it down. As Jesus, our great exemplar, right, did. He exampled that for us. So the guys have arrived in Thessalonica, where we read in verse 1, there was a synagogue of the Jews. Church, and for the benefit of those of you who do not know, a synagogue, two definitions. First uh, is a group of 10 male Jews who gather for teaching and prayer. Secondly, a synagogue is the building where the Jewish assembly uh, meet for religious worship and instruction. It's kind of like us. You are the church, the people. You are the church, and yet we go to the church to have services. So it's the same thing with the synagogue, if you may. But before we move into verse 2, let me share with you a little information about Thessalonica, if you may. So Thessalonica, what I love about this is um, this is old. Man, Paul probably saw this as a building project when he first got there. It started, this is the way it was, old school, right? This is the beginning. The top is typically uh, your buildings in Europe, um, uh, how they are. Thessalonica was one of the wealthiest and most influential cities in Macedonia. The first city, actually, think about this, that Paul visited where his teachings attracted a large group of socially prominent citizens. The who's who of the town were the ones that were coming out to hear this different gospel, this different way of life. Uh, today, visitors to Thessalonica or Salonica, as it's called, find this city to be the second, if you may, um, a modern uh, city in Greece. It is a flourishing regional metropolitan area with, or metro, metropolis with a wide range of museums, uh, shops, and churches. You can actually visit this place. And here's the difference about Christianity and some of the cults that are out there, such as Mormonism, right? Uh, in, in Mormonism, they talk about Jesus leaving the Middle East and going to areas like South America and this and that, and even coming to New York to where uh, Joseph Smith, Smith uh, supposedly received the golden tablets and they buried them and they're there, yet no evidence ever is there. You know, South America, when, we, uh, when they've interviewed some of the archaeologists and people said there is no history that the Mormons say that there was wars fought here and this and that. You'd think we'd find something, zero, everywhere else. And by the way, they cannot find these tablets in New York as well, so you know. But when you go to Thessalonica, when you go to uh, where the Thessalonians were, and later Paul writes letters, uh, you find this stuff. You go to Jerusalem right now, you'll find the empty tomb. You will find these things there. Uh, history just comes alive uh, when you go there. All right, back to our scripture, verse 2. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, we're just a few verses today, so to pay attention. These, these things are dynamite packed. And for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So we would say, Paul is on mission, as we say, right? He's not sightseeing. He's not Googling where the best, uh, you know, hero sandwiches are at or whatever, uh, places to eat. 
He's on mission. So verse 2 informs us uh, that this was his custom to find the Jews. The Jews at this time were, uh, it's a good way. He's looking for God seekers, people that know something about the Bible, something about God, right? Um, God fears uh, in a good way, like I said, fellow men who, like you and me, try to live holy lives, right? So check this out, church. In here, we might find something out about Paul's way, about the way he's going to do it, his formula, if you may, to use when we are speaking with non-believers yet or people who have a shallow belief in the Lord, uh, people who see themselves, and you get this all the time. I, I do, so I'm sure you do. Oh, I'm spiritual. Or we hear about people that are spiritual, uh, and they mean this in a good way, but they're very shallow, and, and you don't know spiritual in what way. You know, we want to take them to the Word of God. So from verse 2, Paul reasoned from the Scriptures, right? This means that he dialogued with them, right? He dialogued with them through uh, questions and answers. Again, as I said when we began, most of us say that we are shy and therefore we cannot really talk, to, or talk with strangers. However, as I also said, uh, you know and I know that a stranger is only a stranger until we have a conversation with them. That is, until we speak with them. From verse 3, right? Look at this. Paul explained from the Scripture. This means he explained or uh, opening the Scriptures to them. Church, there is nothing, and I mean this, and I want you to really take this to heart. There is nothing like sharing the Scriptures, right? Uh, sharing the story of the prodigal son. You know, perhaps you even have been one, right? Lazarus raised to life, right? Uh, Jesus how he died, was buried, and was raised to life, using your own words. Why? I don't have to go to the Scripture and find the text and verse. That trips up so many people. You don't, but you should already have it in your heart and in your mind. Because your words might come back void, but the Word of God never comes back void. Amen? The Word of God is powerful. It's like we say a two-edged sword that separates and gets down to the nitty-gritty of a person's heart and mind. Right? That's the Word of God. So it's good to know it, but I want you to know that you could share it from your own words. Do you realize that the people that you speak with or you talk to or you're around, they relate to you. That's, that's why you're in that circle of people. They're the people that need glass. They're the people that need a house. They're the people that need a meal. They're the people that just need a friend. They want someone to talk to. So when you just begin to talk out of your, whoever you are from whatever, you know, whatever you know, uh, it is great. It is awesome. And the Lord will use that to reach these people. So Paul preached from the Scripture. Again, he set before them one Old Testament proof. Well, let me finish this. Uh, Paul proved, like I said, there's nothing like sharing your, your story, right? Uh, explain the Scriptures. I encourage you to try it from who you are. Uh, Paul proved, secondly, he alleging, there's a word alleging. Paul proved that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And the word translated, look up here, the word translated alleging means to lay down alongside, to prove by presenting the evidence. This is what Paul did. He laid it down. He just started going. These are religious people. He, that's why he went to the synagogue, Jewish people, Jewish training. They know that. Torah, the Old Testament, first five books of the Bible. They know the rest of the Testament. They should. Uh, the Old Testament, he did this. He did all this without using the, the New Testament, <laughs> right? So he shared. This is good. And church, Paul set before them one Old Testament proof after another that Jesus of Nazareth is Messiah God. Paul then preached from the Scripture. He shared that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, quote, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. That's what he did. So Paul was careful. Now listen to this. Paul was careful, as we should be as well, to announce, to announce that is to preach, right, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
which is the message of the gospel according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, and the following verses. Listen, and think about this, because many, many a Bible scholar, many a, a Bible theologian has discovered this to be true, and you need to be true. Think about this, so it becomes a truth with you. And that is this. Without the resurrection, Christianity is doomed. Without the resurrection, there is nothing for us. Without the proof in the pudding that Jesus was raised from the dead after three days, we have nothing to share, right? The reason we know that you can become born again from a life of darkness and sin and be forgiven is because Jesus can breathe on you new life. Because Jesus can save you from your sins. Because we have a belief in someone whom they killed, who died in our place and has resurrected. Without the resurrection, we have nothing. So it's a truth that we preach the resurrection. So Paul, again, he was careful to make sure that after everything I've taught, he said, this Jesus who was crucified, who died on the third day was risen for our sake, he is the Messiah of God. He is our soon coming king. He lives forever as our high priest right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. He hears our pleas of forgiveness as our high priest, and he grants to us forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he is able and just to forgive us of all our iniquities, of everything. He is able to do that, and he does it. We preach Jesus killed, buried, and resurrected. This is, our, this is who we are. We're Christians. Without the resurrection, again, we have nothing. So it's true what they say. Praise the Lord for it. Today, today, let's bring it to today, right now. You and I can share what we know about Jesus. How he's turned our lives around from bad to good. How by coming to this church or a church, you have learned what the Bible has to say about everything and anything. For the Holy Spirit has helped us here at Calvary Chapel learn book by book, from book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, going through the Bible, the whole enchilada, as we say, right, through the Bible, uh, the presentation that we have made. We don't skip. Our teachers don't skip. We go through a book study. Our ladies go through a book study. A lot of ladies groups go, oh, we got a new book coming out, and they become part of a book club, and we'll be here for you. But you come to Calvary Chapel, you've come to a Bible study. We want to be known as a biblical church. And when it all comes to the end, who is left standing? Those who stand on the Word of God. They're the ones that the Lord is coming for as well. There's a lot of good books out there. You can fill your library and fill mantras with good books. But we come for a Bible study. To learn the word of God. That's what helps you grow. That's what keeps you stable through the storms. That's what gives you life and hope for tomorrow. So, again, as I said, Paul had a style. Paul had a custom, we can call. A formula, if you may, in presenting Jesus, right? So from verse 2 and 3, here it is, right? He reasoned. He explained. He proved and he preached Christ risen, all from the Scripture. That's the nitty-gritty of it all. So I say to you, you know, if you don't have your own style, if you don't have a custom how you do it, this can be, this is a biblical little format, little uh, blueprint, but the Lord would want to have you be who you are. But man, does he help us, right? Does he help us? So after this, when we get through with this, what was of what were the results? What were the results? Well, let's look at verse 4, our last verse. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout, of the devout Greeks, and not, to, not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas, right? Now, some of them were persuaded. Not all. Not everyone. You'd think they all would be, 100%. Nope, not all. Uh, maybe we needed a better speaker. Better speaker than Paul? I don't think so. You know, you're presenting, but you're, you're presenting light in a dark world, right? So not all, but none would have been had Paul and his team not taken this venture, this second missionary journey at all. 
The Bible states this in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 through 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? How then shall they, they, who are the they? Church, the they are today our unbelieving neighbors, our family, our friends. They are the they. Thus it is wise, I would say to you, it is wise for us to have a style, to have a custom or a formula in sharing Christ with those around you. Again, we learn from verse 2 that this teaching and preaching took place over three Sabbaths. Over three Sabbaths. The lesson here, and why it's written, is that persuading people who have no knowledge at all of Jesus Christ or are shallow in their beliefs, uh, it, to believe in Him and make a decision for Him takes time. It takes time to do that. I make that point because some of us quit reasoning. And some of us quit explaining. Some of us quit even trying to prove it. And some of us quit preaching after just one or two meetings. We just stop. Oh, they're not going to listen to me. Ah, for not, it's all for naught. Three Sabbaths, three weeks, and their church wasn't 45 minutes to an hour. The services were hours sometimes. They ate and came back. They talked. They opened up the scripture. Right? It says that Paul's team, right, did all four. Reasoning, explaining, proving, and preaching for three weeks. Then some of them were persuaded. Right? Using fishermen's terms, because a lot of us are fishermen. and We like to think we are. You know, we fish every once in a while. But using fishermen's terms, the catch was good. It was a good catch. Luke writes, and not a few. Look at your scripture. And not a few. Meaning what? He meant a lot of people. A lot of devout Greeks. Who are the devout Greeks? These are the serious guys. These are not uh, panhandlers. These are not your bums of the city. These are the guys at the county. You know, this last week I had the privilege of of, uh, opening, uh, uh, giving the opening prayer for our county commissioners and whatnot. So I'm down here at the at the commissioner's place. And uh, uh, these are devout people, people that want to see good in their cities, people that have settled down. They run for office, and they could influence and and keep, uh, hopefully, God, family, and freedom at the top of their list, right? These are good people. So these are the devout people. They're the audience for Paul. So you ruin a few of them, that is a good thing, right? Not a few, uh, meaning a lot. A lot of devout Greeks. And check out this next part. The leading women. Let's just pause there. Think about this. And the leading women in Thessalonica came to Christ. Well, church, most of us know, the rest of us will find out soon enough, that women have a gift. They have a gift of sharing. You could put it in another way. But women have a gift of sharing much, Right? Women aren't shy to get the message out. Uh, I'm probably here today because a good friend of mine, a woman, could shout louder than the waves, can get to the voice of surfers who are about 100 feet out there, 100 yards out there almost, and, and still reach them and say, a man's drowning over here, which I was the man, and get the uh, guys from shore to go out with surfboards and whatnot and pick me up one time. Women are not shy. When it comes to making a point, if they have a point, they're going to let you know. Can I get an amen? Amen. Guys, a little hallelujah. (laughs) Get a hallelujah for me, right? Again, I'm, I'm here because someone stepped out and spoke out. So when it says here that the leading women also came, leading women are influential women. An influential woman, the mom that lays down what's right, the wife that says we should do this as a family. Let's change our priorities so that our family could move forward. There is value in that. And so the, Dr. Luke writes that down. Who could get the gospel out quicker than some of us guys? The women can. Who can do, uh, who announced that Jesus was resurrected from the dead first? A woman did. 
right? So think about this. I love that he includes this. The leading women in Thessalonica, the movers and the shakers. And we call them movers because the guy has the neck, the head, but the lady can move, the, holds the neck and moves it. No, no, honey, look over here, right? Whatever. They were very uh, influential. God used them to get the gospel out in Thessalonica. To share much and to influence much for Jesus is a win-win. Amen? It is a win-win, man. So church, there it is. As we say, there is a, another side of the coin. But you will have to come here again next week to hear that. As we continue with the rest of the scripture. I'm going to ask our worship team to come up. I'm going to ask our, our prayer team to come up at this time. I want to pray for you that this week begins a new beginning for you. That it is a beginning of what is God, what does God want to do with you here at Calvary Chapel, right? Out on the streets. What does God want to do with you here at Calvary Chapel that are in the marketplaces or in the meetings of our town? What does God want to do? You know what he wants to do? He wants to make his son famous. He wants to make his son known through everyone that walks our city streets. Everyone. Right? God wants to do it. How would you respond if he comes and asks you? You should have a method. There should be a custom already developed. There should be something that you will begin to share Christ. And remember, remember, remember what you've already taken in. And if you've been here to church or if you've been a Christian for a while, what you've taken in, the Holy Spirit will bring it back out as you begin to share. Take the first step. Begin to share. Introduce yourself to someone. Share Jesus. It would be wonderful if God started with all this Olympic and junk going out, darkest time in our world right now, that the light would become brighter because you and I care enough to share about Jesus, our soon coming King, and what He's done for us, what He's done for us, and where we're going to go after we leave this place. Father, I pray that this word of yours, Lord, that this recording of Dr. Luke and the missionary team that went out, Lord, that what they did, Lord, would not just be a past history event, Lord, but that, Lord, you would breathe on us through your spirit, Lord, new life. That we would take the gospel out and bring a whole new part of Montrose to you, Lord, to Jesus Christ. That you would receive the honor and glory through our efforts. And we pray this, Lord. Equip us with your word, Lord. Equip us with your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand?